working from your left to right. I'd like for you to take a, a quick glance at these pictures of these individuals and these things and just ask yourself what do they have in common. The gentleman on the bottom corner, his name is Mitchell Hooper. The phone that you see on the top is the newest iPhone, the iPhone 16 Pro Plus. The car that you see on the bottom is the Dagger GT. And then the young lady that you see on the other side, her name is Rebecca Roberts. What do they all have in common? Now, a lot of you are just wide-eyed in this. What does this slide have to do with anything? And if you were to take them as a group, they have nothing in common other than two human beings and two things, right? That's, what, that would be, that's all that they had to have in common. But if you were to take them and put them in respective categories, they would actually be considered either the world's strongest man, the world's strongest woman, the world's strongest phone, or the world's second most strongest car. Mitchell Hooper deadlifted 966 pounds last year in the World's Strongest Man competition. Rebecca Roberts deadlifted 616 pounds in the World's uh, uh, Strongest Woman competition. The iPhone 16 Pro Plus was just released within the last week or two, and it's considered to be the strongest phone that is on the market and probably the most expensive. And the Dagger GT has over 2,000 horsepower, and it can go up above 300 mile an hour. Now, the world's strongest car, and I'd left it off because I didn't know how to pronounce it, but I can tell you that it has over 5,000 horsepower. So Google all of that you would want to, to Google and learn all that you want to learn about all of these things. But I want you to take the Bible that you have in your hand and I want you to just consider an imaginary conversation you're going to have with somebody this week. And they know you're a Christian, and they were to just simply ask you, you know, the Bible has all kinds of words. I'm curious, from your point of view and in your opinion, what would you say, they're asking you, what are the most powerful words in the Bible? What are the strongest words? What would you say? What kind of word would you point them to? Maybe you would use the word promise. Maybe you would use the word salvation. Maybe you would use the word forgiveness. Maybe you, you would use the word hope. What word would you use? For the next couple of weeks, starting this morning and for the next few weeks, I'd like to look at three, what I would consider three of the most powerful words that you will find in your English Bible. And these are three words that are found in both Testaments in a plethora of ways and in a plethora of chapters and books. They are the words that when they hear, when they hit the ears, and if truly embraced in the heart, they will do two things. One, they will have amazing, amazing power in your life. If you will truly just not hear them, but embrace them with your heart and your mind. And two, if you would truly commit yourself to live by them and actually give them to others, they would have an amazing impact and influence in the life of another individual. These words have that much power. And the first word that I want us to look at is the one that Jesus tells very early on in his ministry. A phrase that he uses that rolls right off the tongue. It captures our ears, it captures our mind, it captures our heart, and it's full of challenges. But if we'll embrace it, your life can change. Starting today, your life can change. And if you're willing to embrace it and practice it for the sake of someone else, you can lead them to be changed as well. And Jesus words it this way. At the end of an encounter with an individual, and everybody there is just amazed and shocked that he would have even a conversation, much less an invitation for a person like this. He looks at the crowd then, and if he were standing on this stage, he would look at the crowd now, and he would say, I want you to go and learn what this means, that I desire mercy and not 
sacrifice. The most powerful word we're going to look at here this morning is the word mercy. It's mercy. Now, we need to have the most basic definition on our minds as we move forward through this lesson. And mercy, mercy is essentially not giving someone what they deserve when you have the power to give them what they deserve. Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve when you have the power to give them what they deserve. Mercy is not giving someone what they deserve when you have the power to give them what they deserve. This comes after a very brief but powerful conversation that Jesus has with a man by the name of Matthew. We're introduced to Matthew, who is the author of this particular gospel, who will become one of the twelve apostles, will be responsible for turning the world upside down in the book of Acts, and whose name and whose legacy is associated with good and positive and optimistic things. But his beginning, his beginning is actually just a testament to mercy. As the text opens up for us, it tells us that as Jesus was passing by, that he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me, and he rose and he followed him. It's real easy in the familiarity of the story to just go right on by by this, to march right on past this, because we've heard it so many times and we've probably studied it so many times. But I just want to camp out here for a few minutes, and I want us to go to Jesus, and I want us to learn from Jesus what mercy is. And then I want us to be challenged by Jesus to be individuals who are not just going to receive it, but those individuals who will commit to giving it. Now before we can go further in terms of what Jesus does for Matthew, let's just talk about Matthew for just a very brief moment. And it tells us he's a tax collector. Matthew is stigmatized in his society. And he's actually an individual who is stuck. He is in what we would call no man's land. He has nowhere to go and he has no one on his side. He's committed, he's a Jewish individual who is committed to working for the empire. He is betrayed in the eyes of his people from a nationality perspective. Uh, he He is portrayed as being one of the greatest traitors. You don't work for the enemy. So for those of us that are, are teenagers, the best way that I can describe the betrayal that Matthew gives to his people is that you're dating someone right now, and all of a sudden y'all break up and your best friend starts dating that individual. The ultimate betrayal in your eyes. You, you, how can you do that? And for those of us as adults, the way that I would describe it is the modern day Jew is reported tonight at 6 o'clock having defected and gone and started supporting Hamas. This is the level of betrayal that Matthew has. At this particular moment in the text and in history, this is where he's at. He's stuck. And Matthew, I would, uh, would imagine, realizes that he's stuck and he can't get out. He can't get out and go back home because he's already, from the eyes of other individuals, he's already burned that bridge. And Rome... He can't fully assimilate into Rome because Rome is just going to use Matthew. Matthew's not a human being to them. He's just somebody to warm a seat, get a task accomplished, and when Matthew runs out of being able to offer something to Rome, he's going to be discarded. He is truly stuck. And this is a question that when Charlie and I were discussing this this past week, what does Matthew deserve? Matthew deserves to be stuck. He made the choice. I don't know what played a role in the choice. I don't know where he was. I don't know if it was greed. I don't know if it was desperation. And you don't either. But what we do know is that he made a choice. Well, the way that we would put it is, Matthew, you made your bed. You're going to have to lie in your bed. Matthew, you made your bed. And, well, I didn't realize that Rome, well, you should have thought about that before you made the choice, right? How many of us have said that to other people? Or, how many of us have said, been, been told that? Yeah, Matthew deserves to be stuck in no man's land. He deserves this. He made a decision. Again, I don't know what made that, 
what, what factors were part of the equation. But this, at this particular moment, this is what he deserves. And this is where Jesus comes in, and this is where Jesus embodies the mercy. Jesus stops and he sees Matthew, which tells us that mercy is intentional. Mercy is intentional. And the reason that Jesus' mercy is intentional is because of how eager he is to give mercy. Jesus is operating by the truest of definitions. If he wanted to, he could operate by the truest form of the definition we gave to mercy. Jesus is the perfect individual. Up to this point, and for the rest of his earthly life, Jesus will make every perfect decision. He will not know a moment where he will make a bad decision out of desperation, nor will he make a decision out of greed. He will not make a decision out of selfishness, and he won't make a decision out of anything else that you and I make decisions out of. Jesus will never have to know or understand in the sense of having to, he made his bed, he's now got to sleep in his bed. Jesus has every reason to not only look at Matthew in the eye, but he has every reason to keep on walking by Matthew, just like everybody else. It's not my fault you made the decision. I didn't put you in that seat. I didn't sit at the table when you made your mind up. I didn't decide to turn my back on the people. That's not me. And you know what Jesus show, shows us? Is that even though he could have legitimately and justifiably thought and said and acted in all of those ways, he stops, he sees Matthew, and he calls him. Mercy is intentional because mercy is we need to be eager to give mercy just like Jesus. Jesus is eager to give mercy. And one of the reasons why we struggle so much with not just living out mercy, but giving mercy, is that there are some of us in this room who have not received what Jesus wants to give us. And you cannot give to others what you will not receive from Jesus. You can't give what you don't have. And if you have not received mercy, I want you to know how eager Jesus is to give you mercy this morning. He knows exactly the bed that you have made. He knows every decision that you've made up to this point. He knows every why behind the decisions. He knows the path that you're walking, and He knows why you're walking that path. And for some of us, some of us, we have in common with Matthew, we probably feel stuck, and with our heads, we know that we are stuck. He knows you're stuck. He knows that perhaps you are in no man's land in some part of your life. And you know what he's eager to do? He is eager to give you mercy. He's not eager to walk right on by you. He's not going to look at those who are following him like we've done with others. You know, we kind of see people coming our way, and we'll... We'll kind of hurry up our, space, our pace up a little bit because we either want to outwalk them or we want to walk really fast by them. You know, we've been there. May not something we want to admit out loud, but we've been there. Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't outpace us so that he can avoid us. He doesn't avert his eyes to the left or the right so that he doesn't make eye contact with us. And he could. And he doesn't. Jesus is very eager to give all of us the same amount of mercy he was eager to give Matthew. We don't have to be stuck at whatever our tax booth is. We don't have to leave here and encounter Jesus and still believe that there's nothing that can be done for us. There's a contemporary Christian song that was put out a few years ago and just want to read the lyrics to you. And this is what many of us, again, struggle. It speaks to who we are and why we're so, so, so struggling so much when it comes to receiving what Jesus is truly eager to give us. It starts out that you might be the wife waiting up at night. You might be the man to struggling to provide, feeling like it's hopeless. 
Maybe you're the son who, bro- who chose the broken road. Maybe you're the girl who's thinking you're all alone. And you're praying, you're praying, God, can you hear me? Oh God, are you listening? You are more than flesh and bone, can't you see? You're something beautiful. You've got to believe, you've got to believe. He wants you to see, He wants you to see that you're not just some wandering soul that can't be seen and can't be known. You've got to believe, you've got to believe that you are someone worth dying for. Matthew is stuck. And for whatever his whys are, he still, Jesus still stops and he looks at Matthew and says, you're worth my time and you are worth my investment. Mercy is intentional because Jesus is eager to give mercy. You are worth his time. You are worth his effort. You are worth his sacrifice. You are worth everything that Jesus wants to give you. And you don't have to leave here believing the lie of the enemy himself. At the same time, for those of us who have reached out and have taken his offer of mercy, how intentional have you been with that mercy? Our entire theme this year has been under the umbrella of us becoming like Him. What good are we if we take all that He is eager to give, and we truly take it because we know we need it, and never give it to someone who needs it just as much? He has chosen us to be His vessel to be those who would dispense mercy. As the crowd gathers around and they're shocked and they can't just, they can't again believe that Jesus would just say things like this. And that people would actually react like this. Later on in the evening, Matthew throws a party for all of his friends because he knows tax collectors like himself and he knows sinners like himself. He knows people like himself who are stuck. And he knows that Jesus is the way out, so he throws a party because he wants his friends to meet. And there comes the religious leaders who see this. And what's amazing is that Jesus and the religious leaders all see the same people all in the same thing, but they have two completely different reactions. Jesus sees Matthew and stops and intentionally, intentionally gives him mercy. They saw this, as the text says, And their thing is, out of the smugness of the heart, why does your teacher do things like this? And you know what we are to learn from Jesus about mercy and what we specifically learn from here is that no one has an exclusive right to the mercy of God. No one can lay a claim to the mercy of God and say, this is mine, not yours, and if it is available to you, this is what it looks like, not this way. See, one of the big obstacles for us, and I, and I say us, maybe I'm being too general for me, is that it's hard for me to get past the intentional decisions that people make. I do feel the temptation of letting people, you dug, you dug the hole, you fell into the hole. I tried to tell you not to fall into the hole, you fell into the hole. And I am the Pharisee, I am the Sadducee, I am the religious leader that says they did it to themselves. Why are, why are we in the hole with them? The whole world was in a hole. And he left heaven and came to it. The whole world dug themselves into a pit. And we've been doing it since Genesis 3. And he left heaven and came here. You were in the pit. And I was in the pit. And the moment we start thinking and we start living and we start operating into the exclusiveness of the mercy of God is the moment that we have forgotten we were in the pit. And He came. He didn't put a ladder into the pit. He didn't drop a rope into the pit. He put Himself into the pit. And He carried us out of it. 
This is why it should be easier, and as we're following Him and becoming more like Him, that we would be intentional with the mercy that, that He gave us. We would be intentional with the mercy we would give other people. That in the same eagerness that He had to give us mercy, that we would be just as eager to give it to the other people around us, whether they live with us or they're complete strangers. And I know, I know that we're looking at it and saying, but they did this, and this is something that we need to know when it comes to the mercy. And Jesus walked this line, and this is part of us becoming into His image. We've got to learn to walk the line as well. On one hand, the mercy of Jesus Christ did not allow Him to affirm the lifestyle of Matthew. Nor did it allow Him to affirm the attitude of the religious leaders. Both were terrible. Both of them were awful. Matthew has to leave the tax booth. Mercy isn't going to find him at the tax booth and allow him to stay at the tax booth. He's got to make a clean break from it. But the attitude of the religious leaders is just as awful. And it's just as terrible. And they have to make a clean break from their self-righteousness. I don't have many of you know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, but this is... This is a quote that he had to say in discipleship. Many of you may not know much about him, but if you go and look at any biography or any history concerning him, he actually was a, a, a Lutheran minister under the Nazi regime. And this is what he had to say in terms of us hopefully not falling into the same trap as the religious leaders. Quote, anybody who lives beneath the cross and who has discerned in the cross of Jesus the utter wickedness of all men, and of his own heart will find that there is no sin that can ever be alien to him. Anybody who has once been horrified by the dreadfulness of his own sin that nailed Jesus to the cross will no longer be horrified by even the rankest sins of another human. Looking at the cross of Jesus, he knows the human heart. He knows how utterly lost it is in sin and in weakness. He knows how the heart goes astray in the ways of sin. And He knows that it can be accepted and changed in grace and mercy. In other words, the shadow of the cross will keep me from falling into the pit of self-righteousness and making an exclusive claim on, on the mercy of God said it numerous times, but it's worth repeating, and a part of it is to keep me in check. It's a guardrail for my heart and my mind. There are people who are waking up today after they have done some very terrible things on a Saturday night. We woke up today, and probably, to my own admittance, after screaming at a TV for a football game, and I can't believe the team lost, right? They dug the pit, that's what they get. And we make this comparison. The cross of Jesus Christ tells us that we are no different by being in this building to the person who's waking up to a binge from last night. And that Jesus is eager to give mercy. And this is the thing about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. As ugly as their self-righteousness is, you know who he's eager to give mercy to as well? Them. He's eager to give it to them as well. He wants to give them the same mercy that he's giving Matthew. And that he will give to each and every human being who is willing to hear them, hear him with, his ear, with their ears, and receive them with their heart. And it's the same for me and for you. And that's what the cross, the cross is the great equalizer. Because everybody... Everybody deserves to stay in the pit that they've dug themselves. And the cross says, not only will I not give you what you deserve and what your sin deserves, I will actually take what you deserve into my own life. And so when a crown of thorns is twisted and shoved on top of his head, that should have been my head. And that's mercy. And when a whip scourges the back and tears open the skin and blood just flows freely and it can't be stopped with no amount of gauze, that's mercy. 
And when he's kicked and he's shouted at and he's screamed and he's spit upon, that's mercy. The mercy of God says, not only will I withhold from you what you deserve, I will actually take what you deserve onto myself. So go and learn what this means. But ultimately, the thing about all of this is what we end up doing with it. The temptation of the West is to soak up all the knowledge that we possibly can. Because knowledge is power and that is true. But Christianity and the knowledge of Christianity and the knowledge in this case of mercy was never meant to just simply be a book knowledge. You can quote Matthew 9.13 each and every day and it will flow just as easy every time you quote it. But if you truly go to Jesus and you learn from Jesus to become like Jesus, we ultimately have to live like Him. We have to. So here's what I would like for you to do. You got your phone, pull it out. If you got your tablet, pull it out. If you got a pen and paper, pull it out. If you got a pen in front of you with no paper, use your hand if you need to. Use the card in front of you, but here's what I would like for you to do. I'm going to give you all a chance. And you can text it to yourself. You can email it to yourself. You can write it on your hand so you'll remember. So you can write it somewhere permanent when you wash your hands later, this, uh, later today and it doesn't get washed off. And here's what I want you to do. Because, because mercy is intentional. Mercy is intentional. And the first thing that we saw Jesus do with his intentionality is that he stopped and he saw Matthew. And him being mentioned my name is no accident. So, I want you to type, I want you to text, I want you to email, I want you to write down your Matthew. What's his name? What's her name? See, the truth of this practice is that We've probably been passing by Matthew for quite a while. So while everybody's attention and heart and mind is tuned in, who's Matthew? For the kids at school, is it the one who's stuck in no man's land so they're not fitting in with a sports team, they're not fitting in in a club, they're not fitting in with a band, they're just not fitting? Who is that person? What's her name? What's his name? Write down their name. And if you don't know their name, all the more reason to get to know them this week. What is their name? What is her name? Write it down. What is her name? What is his name? Who is Matthew? Who is Matthew? Identify him. Write down his name. Write down her name. Who is Matthew? My custom is to to end the sermon with a prayer, and we're going to do that in just a moment. But one of the things I'm going to do in the middle of that prayer is I'm going to stop praying out loud. And you're going to pick up praying and in your heart and your mind and you're going to pray for the name that you just wrote down. And I want you to pray for them every morning and I want you to pray for them every evening. And I want you to pray for an opportunity. Not just to see them, but to do exactly what Jesus did and that is stop and talk to them. Mercy is intentional. Mercy is intentional. There's no reason, no reason for us to be too busy to see Matthew. So who is your Matthew? What is her name? What is his name? And I want you to pray for them. And I specifically want you to pray for an opportunity at some point to be able to talk to them. Not some point in the distant future. Not some point in a generic way. Some point tomorrow. 
to be able to talk to them. Tomorrow. Yesterday, we said that today we would start something. Today is a good day to be intentional with the mercy that God has given us. So I want you to pray for them. And I want you to pray for an opportunity to talk to that person. Because mercy, as great as it is in terms of feeling, ultimately Matthew was able to follow Jesus because Jesus stopped and talked to him. So we're going to pray. And I'll transition us to a few seconds and I want you to pray for your person whoever it is, and then the whole lesson will be yours. You have your name? Let's pray for them. Father, we thank you for your son. Humanity made a mess of everything that you have given us. You created everything that we hear, see, and know, including us, out of love. And out of selfishness, humanity pursued other things. And you could have just left us. And we would have deserved every bit of what came to us. But you didn't. You gave your son. And he gave us mercy. And every single soul in this building, whether we recognize it or not, we are in his mercy. But just as we have received mercy, Father, we pray that you will develop and that you will conform us to the image of your Son to where we will be intentional and just as eager to give it. And so at this moment, each person here has been asked to identify a Matthew. A single person who has a name created in your image and a person that Jesus loves and a person that Jesus died for. And it's a person that you have brought into our life. Father, we ask for forgiveness of all the many times that we passed by them and never once stopped and looked at them and saw them the way that Jesus saw them. And so now, we're going to pause for just a moment and all of us are going to offer an individual prayer for that Matthew, for him or for her. Father, silence is truly uncomfortable. But what a great use of it. Because for just a brief moment, we weren't thinking of ourselves, but we were thinking of someone else. Which is exactly what Jesus did. As he thought of others and not of himself only. So now we pray for an opportunity. This day, tomorrow, and every day. To be able to sit, to see, and to sit with a Matthew and to let them know how much they are loved and how eager Jesus is to be merciful to them. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Perhaps you're Matthew. Perhaps the one you prayed for was not someone outside of yourself, but perhaps it was you. Today is a wonderful opportunity to leave behind all that has been holding you back spiritually and to come follow Him. To follow Him down into the waters of baptism and to follow Him out of the water for the rest of your life, walking in a path of mercy. And if that's what you need to do and if that's what you're eager to do, we're eager to help you. Because we are not perfect people, but we are forgiven people who have embraced His mercy. And if that's what you need to do, then we encourage you to do that as we stand and sing.